It's a myth about the great African warrior. We didn't need a great warrior because we didn't fight wars. When we had to meet people on the battlefield, we did get ready and we did fight in self-defense, but we did not have armies of aggression sitting around waiting to kill anybody or invade anybody. So the African warrior thing is a myth. All Africans were warriors. There is no other way to see or understand Kemet. What became the Nile River was a desert valley. Centuries and centuries before, millennia before, what is called the Sahara Desert was a fertile river valley. Bodies have been found within the last two years in the Sahara that predates any mummified body in Kemet. So mummification didn't start in Kemet. I learned when I first started going to Ghana because of my relationship to royalty, all of Ghanaian royalty still gets mummified. That's why they don't have immediate funerals, okay? Because there's a certain period of time, 70 something days, that you have to submerge that body in salt and suck all of that fluid out of it to keep the bacteria from causing the degeneration of the body and moving the organs, of course, and making sure you do the same thing to them. This process still goes on in West Africa and East Africa and Southern Africa today. While Kemet was still a desert on the periphery, Southern Africa was the green, fertile valley. Eastern Africa, Uganda, Ethiopia, these are green, fertile valleys. But something happened and shift in the ecology. They said a shifting of the earth on the axis. Whatever happened, over thousands of years, the Sahara began to dry up. Much of the water that is now shifted to the south begins to spill over into the valleys and move downstream, which is Northern Africa. The Nile is the only river that flows from the south to the north. And so water is coming out of tributaries in Mozambique, Malawi, in Congo, in Ethiopia, in Uganda, is now racing down what was a dry valley, bringing all the muds and the silts from the swamps and the rainforests of the south and the east and some of the west and creating this enormously fertile corridor all the way to the Mediterranean. The Sahara is drying up and the lakes like Lake Chad, which is 1% of what it was a thousand years ago, there was even rivers running from the Atlantic Ocean to Lake Chad and into that area. Um, that's all underground now. And the satellites take pictures of the underground aquifer with its billions of barrels of water under the desert. Um, uh, Gaddafi had tapped into one of those aquifers to provide water for Libya and for the Libya agricultural industry. Um, but the population at a certain point in history began to shift westward and eastward, looking for fertile grounds. And at the same time, the population in the southern sphere began to look northwards, you know, for fertile ground. And the Nile, as it was coming into being, provided that. And so because of the ecological balance that occurred in the Nile Valley, a most extraordinary ecological balance that allowed for the production of agriculture, it provided for people food, clothing, and shelter in an enormous way. And so people came from all over to become a part of this ecological boom where you can plant food, where you can nourish your animals, where you have the material to build housing, et cetera, et cetera. Sell your surplus and make income to buy other things for your family. All of this is what the Nile is providing. This is the foundation of civilization. And people came from all over and brought their tools and their skills and their understanding of husbandry, of agriculture, of building, and it produced this society we know as the Great Kemet that lasted for thousands and thousands of years until the barbarians from the north came down. So yes, the people, when the Greeks come and the Romans came and the Hittites and the Hyksos, and there's two Hittites invasion, two Hyksos invasion, the Assyrian invasion, there's a second Assyrian invasion, a Persian invasion, there's a second Persian invasion, then you get the Roman invasion, the Greek invasion, and this happened over a couple of thousand years, a thousand or more years within that space. 
and people leave and everybody don't come back. So each time we drive these demons out of our land, some people come back, but most don't come back. You know where they go? Back to the ancestral land where the old stories told them they came from in the first place. So they go to become the Yorubas. They go to become the Ga. They go to become the Ewe. They go to Chad. And the biggest tribe in Chad and Northern Cameroon is called the Sa-Ra. That means the family of the Sa-Ra, the family of the sons of God. When we study, people came from all over Africa and created Kemet. And when Kemet exploded or imploded, they left and went back to the places they came from. What they're calling Christianity, of, and you've heard me say this before decades ago, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are fragments from the periphery of the African spiritual or cultural system. And that's what you have, that these people invade your land. They didn't come looking for Christianity. They didn't come looking for God. They come looking for wheat. They come looking for iron. They come looking for barley. They come looking for um, linen. They come looking for cotton. And they come looking for animals. That's why they invade your land. The same reason they practice colonialism and neocolonialism now, that's what the Greeks and the Romans and the Turks, that's what they were doing then. But when they got there and they got the wealth and they saw the harmony and balance that existed in your society, they sought to then institute that into their society. Of course, our ancestors, our scientists, who we now falsely call priests, did not give them all of it. They gave them enough of the system to help organize their barbarity so at least a civil order could exist. And out of that organizing structure and body of knowledge has evolved Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And they've added to their literature, um, folklore, fairy tale, fantasy, and a little fragment of history and call it their holy books. But it's simply rules to live life by in a way that you can have some harmony and some balance and some peace. Obviously, they didn't learn enough of it because they've never been in peace one day since we met them. Well, there is a church body in, based in Egypt that is called the Copts, Coptic Church. There is a community of people who speak a dialect of Medunetja that's called Coptic, who live in Egypt primarily, but they live in other places too. Many of these families are members of the indigenous Africans who lived in the Nile Valley, okay? When this discussion came on the especially Roman dominance of creating a social governance that would be the socialization process for the society, which would later be called Christianity. The discussion around how people should live and behave and according to what rules meets with a lot of conflict because the Africans saying, okay, what you're trying to say, that ain't the deal. And so a lot of African groups broke away because the Romans are the military power now. They're the political power. You Africans did not have political power in that part of North Africa, Northeast Africa. The Romans have the political and the military power. So they're dictating what the social ecology is going to be. They're dictating what the socialization process and cultural um, system is going to be. Today we look at it and we say religion. They weren't talking about religion the way we're talking about it now. They were talking about culture. They were talking about socialization. What is it we're all going to believe? What is it we're all going to respond to? What are the things we're all going to celebrate? What are the things we're going to all pay homage to? in order to keep on track in a common way. And so a disagreement came when the Romans and those uh, historians and priests that they had gathered together, starting at Nicaea, to write the Bible took almost a thousand years. People don't know that they didn't write it in one setting. It is, this is almost a thousand year process, number of different conferences, changing things. And then the split came where the Romans said that God has two elements, two personalities, uh, man and God, and that Jesus symbolizes 
uh, both. And the Africans say, no, God is one. He doesn't have this kind of division. It is just one thing and we're all a part of it. And that becomes the split. And those who say God is one, other people we are calling the Coptic Church. Out of that will arise what we call the Ethiopian Church. Okay. And all of this happens before there's a Catholic Church. And certainly before the 1500s when it becomes the Protestant Church with the Luther, the Reformation of Luther and the Lutheran Church, which leads to the Baptist, the Methodist, Episcopal, Epid, and all that stuff. Those are babies trying to interpret this body of information which the white Romans got from the Africans and wanted to misinterpret. And the Africans saying, we're not gonna go with your misinterpretation. So the African church becomes what you call the Coptic church. And that becomes the Ethiopian church. Till today, those views are the same. The form of slavery that we're talking about, which is called chattel slavery, that really comes from the Ottomans, the Turks. We think of Islam, we think it's always been ruled by Arabs. No. It started with the Arabs in the 6th century. By the 8th century, it's already taken over by foreigners. By the 9th century, they have total control by the end of the 9th century. And they will have that total control of the Islamic world until the first World War. You know how much time that is? The Ottoman Turks out of the Caucasus Mountains, all right? The Kurds and the Turks is controlling Islam. We are calling them now Arabs. They're not Arabs. They never were Arabs. They, coming into Africa, into Kemet, begin to enslave the indigenous population. And then going into Libya and the rest of North Africa, doing the same thing there. Then coming down into what is now Niger and Mali and Nigeria, and they do the same thing there. So, and so they're selling us, they tried, but no one talks about their attempt to conquer Ethiopia and how they got their asses whipped. You hear me? No one, to, so Ethiopia have a small Muslim population virtually in one little region and virtually in one, one big town because the Ethiopians didn't play that. And so they whipped them. But they had some and they got down to Uganda they didn't make much headway there either, but they had a little more headway in Tanzania and, and, and Kenya, you know, even though they didn't dominate it. But from Kemet, Sudan, going north, they got the power. That's why we have the fighting going on in Sudan today between those who are saying I'm Arab and those who are saying I'm Sudanese, you know. The UNESCO History on Africa, the eight volumes, excellent, excellent work by scholars from all over Africa and from some other parts of the world. It's probably the best history ever written on Africa thus far by a group of people. And you will see a lot of this material there, um, where they are selling us into the Indian Ocean, selling us into the East as far as China, selling us into India, selling us into Europe, into uh, the so-called Middle East and North Africa. And so when the in when 1400s, when the Portuguese a break away from the, the Moorish Empire and began to explore the African coast. They're not looking for slaves or to enslave anybody. The Ottoman Muslims have cut the European completely off from Africa and the East. So they can't control any commerce. All the commerce is in the hands of the Ottomans. See, if you want to understand why the Portuguese even left Portugal in the first place and came to the west coast of Africa, you have to understand what was happening at that time. Two things is occurring. The bubonic plague, the Black Death, is beginning in Europe. It'll eventually kill half of the population of Europe. So Europeans are trying to get the hell out. At the same time, the Ottoman Empire had effectively cut the entire European, Western European world off from trade with the East, with China, with India and other Eastern countries and with Africa. And so now they, Europe, which is basically a meat eating society, have no way to preserve their meat because there's no refrigeration. They preserve their meat through spices and salt. 
And so they were coming, the Arabs were bringing the salt from North Africa, from Mali and those areas, and that was worth more than gold. So the Europeans were trying to figure, how can we get access to this stuff? They didn't realize the African continent was as big as it was. So they had heard Portugal, which have now become a Catholic nation, which is in partnership with the Vatican in Rome, want to go and find Prester John, the mythical king of Ethiopia that they've heard about in Europe, that there is this Christian kingdom that the Muslims have not been able to conquer. And if only they can reach this Christian kingdom in Africa, they could then outflank the Muslims and open up the trade routes again. So that's what, how this whole thing starts out, right? Of course, then they meet the rest of us on the way to Ethiopia. Portugal will finally make it to Ethiopia by the 1500s. But in the meantime, you run into Guinea, Nigeria, to Ghana, to Congo, and you see all these black folks with all this wealth, and you go crazy and become criminally insane. And then in the midst of that, you had Christopher Columbus landing in North America, seeing all the agricultural possibilities, trying to find gold, but there isn't enough gold. But they realize there's other wealth here, but it requires labor. The Native Americans are dropping like flies from the diseased bodies of the Europeans. And the main disease they're bringing is pneumonia, influenza, and the common cold. And so they brought this with them, and it was killing people and so the one person who was immune to them, because they've been invading us for a couple of thousand years, was the Africa. We weren't dying from them, but we had all of the skills they were looking for. We were the agronomists. We, were, we had animal husbandry. We had agricultural skills on every plane. You know, all the things they need to make America profitable for them. And so that is the impetus. There's a skilled population that have all of the skills that we need to do what we want to do here to make this pay for us, to take this agricultural goods back to Europe, the spices and the other things back to Europe that we can buy with this, and we will save ourselves. And that's what the slave thing started out as, and that's what it is today. Now we call it colonialism and imperialism, but it was colonialism and imperialism then. And for the same reason, we got the natural resources that you want or we can help you produce them. In the meantime, there was already a slave system in place for 1,500 years that the Ottoman Turks had put in place and they partnered with the Western European. And that's what really fueled the transatlantic slave trade, not Africans selling Africans. Let me say that again, it's a myth, this thing about Africans selling Africans. I'm sure that happened with a few greedy, sick people. But for the most part, Africans were fighting to save Africans. That you'll find in our art tradition all through our history. But we were outgunned and outnumbered by military people. We were not military societies. It's a myth about the great African warrior. We didn't need a great warrior because we didn't fight wars. So stop that myth, trying to imitate the white man. When we had to meet people on the battlefield, we did get ready and we did fight in self-defense, but we did not have armies of aggression sitting around waiting to kill anybody or invade anybody. So the African warrior thing is a myth. All Africans were warriors. All were obligated to protect their society and defend the integrity of their village and their city and their town. And you will find that if you go into West Africa and you study the history and you go up to Salaga, one of the biggest slave camps in West Africa, and hear their story. If you go to Paga, along the borders of Burkina Faso and Ghana and see the slave camps up in those mountains and hear their stories, then you'll know how our people fought to keep us from being captured and taken into slavery.